Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. We are having a unique conversation here today and we haven't addressed this subject since 2020 during COVID and when I had the 50th episode celebration when I had a few friends on and we discussed racism, prejudice, and we talked about all of the things related to the George Floyd murder. So it has been a while since we addressed this topic, and I am so incredibly excited to have this conversation today. We're going to dive into anti-racism and what that actually means. And I think that if you're like me, you are going to be so inspired and enlightened by this conversation. So what happened and how I found today's guest, Alyssa Hall, is that my business coach was at a mastermind retreat with her business coach and Alyssa came to them and spoke to their mastermind group. And my coach, Kim Trathen actually did a social media post about how amazing Alyssa was. And immediately when I read that post, I reached out to her on Instagram and I said, I have to have you on my show. Would you be willing to come on and interview with me? And she said, yes, I'd love to. And so here we are today having this conversation. But I think as the world has turned in the past two years, we thought that in 2020, things were going to shift, things were going to turn around, but that isn't necessarily the case. And there are a lot of people who still do not understand what racism is and what anti-racism means. So we are going to dive into that today. And as entrepreneurs and as moms and as anyone in business, we have the opportunity to help educate and to help change the conversations around race. And even I think we can apply this to so much more than even race as we dive into this conversation, because there are a few things we're going to talk about that I think will ultimately stand out across multiple facets of just humanity. But I'm going to stop rambling so that we can bring on our special guest and get this show on the road. So without further ado, Alyssa Hall, welcome to the Robin Graham show. Yes. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to have this conversation and listeners. We were just chit chatting before I started recording. And I said to her, if I say something wrong, if I say something incorrect, call me out on it because chances are, if I'm thinking something, or if I say something wrong, someone else is thinking the same thing or has said, or may say in the future, the same thing. So if she calls me out on it, I asked her to, so that I can have my brain rewired to think properly and correctly, not incorrectly. So just don't think she's being rude if that happens, but hopefully it <laughs> won't happen. But anyway, just wanted to put that caveat in place. Okay. So Alyssa, will you just tell us please a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today doing the incredible work you're doing as an anti-racism consultant and a leadership coach? Yes. So I'll just give y'all the short version of what that looks like. But I started out my journey wanting to be a coach because I had actually originally wanted to be a therapist and I had already had my daughter and the schooling journey was going to be a long time and I needed to make money. And so I'm like, okay, a coach is the baby therapist. Let me just do coaching while I'm still in school. And I told myself I was going to be a career coach. I had my first client. It was so boring that I just hated it. <laughs> and I was like, I'll be a mom coach. That sounds like more fun. And I was doing that for about a year. And one George Floyd's murder happened. It felt like the internet imploded in terms of the way that everyone was just like running around like headless chickens, trying to figure out what to do and how to react. And for me, I was like, oh, I thought more people had a grasp on this than I'm seeing. And it was more from a place of just worry of, are y'all okay? I, it doesn't seem like any of y'all are okay right now. So I started just like saying little things here and there. I ended up like going live every single day on my, on my Facebook just to offer support. And then my business coach at the time had said, why don't you just make this your niche? I'm like, what do you mean? I just finished my website for the mom coaching. I don't want to change my niche now. And then a couple of days later, my therapist said the exact same thing. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? It's not as easy as you think. Oh my God. And then I ended up making it my niche and 
I feel so aligned. I don't think I've ever felt this aligned in work that I'm doing before, but yeah, that's the short version (laughs) of how I got here. Isn't it funny how God plants these seeds along our way? And I'm I'm just finishing up. I'm way behind schedule because I traveled for a wedding and stuff, but I'm just finishing my May content. And I was writing out a post earlier about how God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And I said, be aware of the people he puts in your path because yeah. honest to goodness, if we can feel confused, we can feel dissatisfied or unfulfilled. And then all of a sudden we have a conversation and it's, whoa, okay. <laughs> that was a message straight from heaven. It's so yes. funny, but so I love that story. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. And then we had talked before the show, everyone about a few statements that I want to have Alyssa walk us through and really emphasize some of this anti-racism work that she's doing. But first, First, tell us a little bit more about how you're working with your clients today. Yes. So really the work that I do with my clients is helping them understand what anti-racism actually means on the daily. I feel like a lot of the rhetoric that we've heard before 2020 and maybe even still now is like being a good person or being an aware person. And that's great. But when we have a business and we have way more of an influence and an impact, We can shift things in such a huge way as it boils down to even just systemic issues. We have a role in that. And so the work that I do with my clients is helping them with their businesses and seeing like, how can we make this more equitable? How can we make this more inclusive? How can we make sure that certain systemic racism things aren't inside of your business as we've all been taught to have them. And so I do that with entrepreneurs and I also do that with larger corporate businesses as well. I love it. And it's such important work. And it's funny because before 2020, I had several black friends and I love them. I never thought Mm -hmm. anything of it, but then 2020 happened. And it's almost like I became paranoid. Am I saying the right thing? Am I looking the right way? Am I doing the right thing? And I really don't like that feeling. And some of the things that we're going to talk about today, I think help resolve that help quiet some of those insecurities and questions we have when we're looking at someone with a different colored skin or someone who is from a different ethnic background. And in my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, I have a chapter on curiosity. And one of the things that I say is that it's so much better to get curious versus judging. We can't assume what someone else is because we can never walk in someone else's shoes. We haven't walked in their shoes. And without doing that, we can't understand fully what their life is like, what they are going through. And of course I was speaking from the perspective of mental health and anxiety, but it's the same thing when we're talking about different ethnic backgrounds, different skin colors, anything like that. Let's talk about that a little bit because I just slid that in there about skin color. (laughs) But back in 2020, when everything started happening, people would say, I don't see color. And that Mm -hmm. drove me nuts because I mean, as an artist and everything, I see color and I love color and I don't want to strip color from anything. And to me, taking away color from a human being is saying you aren't really who you think you are or Mm -hmm. your heritage isn't what you think it is or me ignoring. If I were to say that to me, that would mean that I don't see you for who you are. I only want to see you the way I want to see you. And I don't think that's fair. So before we started recording, I said, it's no different than somebody looking like avoiding my blue eyes. Oh, I think you have brown eyes because they don't want to see me as someone that has blue eyes. My blue eyes are like my distinguishing factor. So like, I don't want to strip that away from people. So let's talk about that because obviously my perspective is different than your perspective, but you have that expert perspective because of who you are and the work you're doing both. Yes. So the biggest thing, and I'm a child of the nineties and I was for the first like five, six years of my life, I was in a predominantly white neighborhood. And so the saying of, I don't see color, that was just the norm. And it wasn't anything I ever really thought of until my adulthood where I was like really 
re-looking at all the experiences that I've had. So when I hear someone saying, I don't see color, it's from this place of, oh, you're just like me. I'm not holding your color against you. I don't have any negative thoughts about you because of your color. But in reality, what's also in that same vein being said is I don't see color, meaning I don't see the layers of your experience. And I think that's the big thing to understand when we're thinking about race and racism and how these things come to play is that me showing up in the world as a black woman means that I am experiencing the world differently Mm -hmm. than maybe you have experienced the world and being able to take that into consideration when we are, I don't know, being friends, when we're being a coach client, all of those things need to be taken into consideration so that we're supporting people in the way that they need to be supported, taking into account all of these other things. Like another example that I use a lot is if you had a friend, Jessica, and Jessica's, yeah, John at work, he tapped my butt and said, good job. We're going to have a different thought in our head compared to if Mark says, yeah, John at work tapped my butt and said, good job. One thing sounds like a football analogy. And then the other one sounds like sexual harassment. And it's because we're seeing Jessica for as her gender and how that can come into play with the way she's being interacted with in the world. Oh, that's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you described that as it's like we're taking away, stripping away the color. It's almost like making somebody else feel comfortable versus letting the reality of experiences come into play because the experiences we have on a daily basis define who we are. Mm -hmm. And if we strip that away, then we lose sight of who the person actually is. And it almost forces that person then to mold and shift into whatever version you see them as. And it makes it a little bit more uncomfortable for the person to be whoever they fully are because they have to mold and assimilate, which is what a lot of marginalized groups are taught to do. We're taught to assimilate. And it's easy to do that when people are like, oh, I don't, I I don't see color. Of course, because a lot of us have been taught to assimilate. And that's hard. I think when it's, so I'm an anxious introvert. So for me Mm -hmm. to assimilate, to be like other kids, I had, that was extremely stressful for me Mm -hmm. going to a birthday party and pretending to be excited and having fun. Yeah. I wasn't having any fun. I was hurting inside. I was terrified. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like that though, because you're hiding who you really are and you can't fully express your joy or your any emotion really Mm -hmm. when you're not expressing who you truly are. And it becomes incredibly exhausting. And I think like a lot of people just like jumping back on what you said before about like before 2020, like I had black friends. I didn't think anything of it. There was no anxiety there. And then post 2020, like a lot of my clients had thoughts of, okay, was Jessica being her full self with me? Or was she just molding herself in a way that she felt would make me comfortable? because that's another thing that marginalized groups have been taught to do as a means of survival. Yeah. And these are things that obviously that perspective has never been brought to my attention. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So I think what we can say here is anti-racism is not seeing a lack of color. It's not saying, oh, I don't see that you're a different color. (laughs) See, we're all the same because we're not all the same. As a population, as a whole, or on the whole, however you say that, we have had totally different experience. Yeah, 100%. And I'm going to encourage the listeners to go back and listen to episode 50. It's a really long episode, but there was so much value in there. And this is an example that my neighbor actually, during all of the George Floyd stuff, she and her daughter came over and they were looking at our puppy. And I looked at her and I said, Tyra, are you okay? And she started to cry and she said, oh my gosh, no one has asked me that. 
And then I started crying. So we're having a little cry party in my driveway, but it was interesting to me how then when we had the conversation on the podcast about how her son is the same age as my daughter and they're friends, they hang out. And she said, we were talking about how cute her kids are now, but in several years, when they're the size of men, Mm -hmm. safe is it going to be for them to walk down the street in this primarily white neighborhood, affluent area. And to hear my friends say that was such an eye opener, such a shock, because I had never thought of it that way, that as his mother, she has to worry wherever he goes and whatever he does, something totally different than what I've had to do with my boys. So I just wanted to bring that into the conversation because I think it's very empowering to, to see life in that perspective on how different just people in general, because of the color of their skin can be percepted. And then how taking away that color does not necessarily change that, but it eliminates or takes away the person as who they are and what their heritage is. And even that's actually a perfect example that you gave because now by being able to see color, right now you're able to support your friend in a different way compared to assuming that everyone's situation of having, well, when they become like teenagers, that everyone is having the same types of anxiety, when in reality, her anxiety is going to be possibly doubled because of the situation that she's in. Yeah. And because her children are children of color. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of leads me into the next thing I wanted to talk about. And that was making assumptions. And like you said, people made the assumption that you're the same, never had the assumption that we're the same, but I'm so curious. It's almost detrimental because I love to ask questions. And I think that was, is sometimes a benefit though, but at the same time, it's also when you're around people that are different from you and come from a different background it is scary to ask questions sometimes because Mm -hmm. you don't know what the perception of the question is going to be and whether it's appropriate or not appropriate. And, and so making assumptions, what do they say about the word assumptions? When you assume something, you make an ass out of you and me. Yes. Um, (laughs) We usually, I usually don't ever curse, but I had to throw that in there. But I, so let's talk about that because I think that making assumptions when it comes to race or ethnic background can really do exactly that. It can really make us look like scumbags. Yes. And that is something that I have been aware of like pretty much my entire life. So I am a dark skinned black woman. I am African American and I'm also Cuban. And my mom is also a dark skinned black woman, but she's not American. She's Cuban, born in Cuba. She's an immigrant. And so her whole life, people have assumed that she was African-American and she has had to like every single time have to correct people. I'm just like, I'm not even American period. I wasn't even born here. And it's easy to make those types of assumptions, especially about a specific group of people like, oh, they're all the same. They have the same experiences. They have the same cultural background. And for my mom, it's, we don't even speak the same language. I actually had to learn English when I immigrated here. And so that's one big way that I see the assumption making. I'll pause there to give, to allow you to give your thoughts. <laughs> no, keep going because I'm fascinated and I can see where that happens because there mm-hmm. are, and sometimes you can tell by accent, somebody from mm-hmm. Jamaica is going to be dark skinned black person, but they have an accent. And sometimes you can tell if there is like a, what a mix of nationalities. So like Cuban and black mm-hmm. or something like that, Hispanic and black, something like that. Sometimes you can tell by the features and things like that, but it's funny because you can't look at a white person and know what their heritage is. So why would we right. be looking at a black person, what their heritage is? You know what I mean? Like exactly. I have so many nationalities in me that nobody can guess. And I am 29 now. No one has like correctly assumed what my background is ever. They just assume that I'm African-American because I'm black and because my last name is Hall. So it's in, in like in English. And then when I speak Spanish, it's, or when I say that I'm Hispanic, it's, oh my gosh, say something in Spanish. I didn't know you spoke Spanish. Prove to me that you're Hispanic. And then 
like I'm also fluent. And then it's okay. So what kind of Spanish are you? Then we run down the whole list. Like this is stuff that I have dealt with literally my whole life. And even bringing up the example of my mom, she immigrated here when she was four. So she doesn't even have an accent. And so even seeing all of those different layers where, like you said, there's the assumption of, oh, I can, I know what this person is and I know who they are. And I know even people like aligning their prejudices that they have about groups of people with other groups of people because of those assumptions. That's another very big assumption. But like you said, we would never look at a white person and try to assume we know what they are unless they have, unless we're in the U S and they have a Southern accent. I think that's the only time yeah. that maybe, people ever assume maybe red hair and blue eyes. And you automatically think Irish or Scottish, but for most of us, we're pretty non right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's are, a huge assumption. What are some of the other assumptions that you've experienced or that people that you're you've worked with have experienced? Yeah. I think the assumption of that one person who can speak for a lot of people. So it's not uncommon for some of my clients to already have black people in their circle who have or who have black friends. And it's my friend said that this isn't problematic, or my friend said I'm doing fine. And what I have to redirect people towards is like, when you're asking your friend, you're asking about their very personal opinion. When you're asking me an expert, I'm not necessarily speaking for the entire black community, but I'm looking at it from a different perspective. I'm looking at it from like an educational perspective. Oh, okay. Back in the day, this hugely racist thing happened. And this is what it has translated to in modern day. Therefore, whether your friend is offended by it or not, it's still wrong because it's connected to this thing. Like digital blackface is a perfect example, right? Like it, that's, it goes back to the, uh, I don't remember exactly what they were called, but the shows and the plays that they had, like in the early 1900s where white men would dress up in blackface, the minstrel shows. And so now when we're like looking at social media and people are using GIFs of people who don't look like them, of typically black people, now that has that connection. So it is digital blackface. Even if a specific person isn't offended, it's still wrong. But that's a huge assumption I hear all the time of, oh, this person says it's okay. I've heard that this is fine. You're making that one person the the community head i guess when mm -hmm. it's not really like that yeah because you can't assume that everyone is going to have the same exact thought or reaction to something so let exactly. me ask you that so when you're talking about those gifs if say and i haven't done this but say i did put a gif of a black person on my instagram feed would that be considered digital blackface if you're trying to have the gym be a representative of your thoughts or your feelings, then interesting. I never would have thought that. Mm -hmm. And another way that it shows up too is like on TikTok, where they're like lip syncing to something that someone of a, of another nationality said, but they're also trying to act out as that said nationality by their own like biases or stereotypes or whatever. So if it's like a black woman who's saying something, then they're going to act 12 times more sassy than they actually do as they are lip syncing. It's that's another version of what that looks like. Wow. And I see that all the time. Not good at that. Like I can't do that sassy. <laughs> I say to my <laughs> friend, Erica, I'm like, you're so good at sassy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah move her shoulders and flip that finger. I cannot do that. Yeah. And it's, it depends if that's just how you are as a person, then I'm not telling you to not be yourself, but if that's not how you are as a person, you're trying to act as if, because you believe that the voice calls for it, then what you're in, in essence doing, you're caricaturizing black women. Yeah. And that's where it becomes again, problematic, but a random black person on the street may not feel that it's problematic and that is fine, yeah. but it's still problematic. Because some one person may. Because it, it has its connections to deeply historical racist things, right. or it has its connection to prejudices or stereotypes or biases. Since you mentioned that, I think stereotypes and biases are something that we should hit on because I think that 
a lot of people assume that, oh, she's black. So she came from a poor family. She came from a broken family. She never had a dad. Mm -hmm. And I see this a lot at Face to Face, the organization I'm on the executive board for. We don't treat our clients like that, but a lot of our clients come in and do not have birth certificates. And this is a fact that I have found the majority of white people have no idea about this, but there are several reasons that happens that black people may not have a birth certificate. And it could be that a lot of times they couldn't afford healthcare. So they were born, the babies were born at home by a midwife. Mm. There was no legal documentation of their birth. It could be that they've had to move around so many times and the birth certificate is lost. There are other factors as well, but it's, it was fascinating to me to learn all of this. And had I not been on the involved so heavily at face-to-face, I probably wouldn't know all of this, but I think there are a lot of stereotypes and biases that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll give to, I, I explain things only in examples. I have two examples of how I see this show up a lot. The first one is an HGTV example. Do you watch HGTV? Okay. I do. <laughs> I've given this example like five times within the last week and a half. And you are the first one who said, yes, I watch HDTV. So I feel very validated. But in like flipping houses, for example, you do the thing, you bust down the house, you build it back up, and then you have to get an appraisal. And the appraisal essentially tells the banks like, hey, this is how much you need to give a loan for this house. And if the appraisal comes out at 500,000, but the actual like value of the house is 700,000, then it's going to be hard for someone to sell that house because Mm -hmm. the bank is only going to give the 500. And so I give this example to show racism can look like in a way that I feel like people don't really pay attention to. So let's say the house, oh, sorry, let me back up. One thing in appraisals that is very, I don't want to say well-known because it's not very well-known, but a major issue in the appraisal world is that Typically, Black-owned houses appraise for way less than houses that are owned by a white family. And so what that can look like is more so like the appraiser, let's say he's walking through the house and there's no like pictures on the wall. You can't tell who lives there. So it's a complete blank slate. And let's say the appraiser goes to a room and like the light fixtures haven't been completely screwed in. Like there may be a door off the hinges, but you can tell that this house is like very nice and has just been done. The appraiser has to walk in completely making his own assumptions and is, oh, you know what? Clearly this is a flip. They just have to finish that last door and finish that last light fixture. Okay. You know what? I'm just going to give the value of the house for what it would be if it were done. Right. Compared to, let's say it were a black family doing the exact same flip and there's maybe family pictures on the wall. So you can tell that a black family lives there. And so now he's going through the house with a different mindset, right? So now what's walking with him through the house are the prejudices and biases that he has about black people. And he may, he's not thinking that, but that's just what happens naturally when we see a human. And so he gets to the broken door, he gets to the broken light fixtures. And instead of assuming it's a flip, instead he has the thought of, oh my gosh, look at how they just tore up this beautiful house. This house can't sell like this. And now they have me coming, walking through and it's all torn up. Like this house can't appraise for whatever it's supposed to appraise for. So I need to knock it down because clearly there's some, this, this house is now a fixer upper. And then that brings the value down. And the appraiser is not a bad human right? The appraiser is just a person who has regular prejudices and biases that have gone unchecked. And now that's showing up in their work and is affecting the people on the other side. That was a really long example, but does that make sense? Oh, it makes total sense. And I think that our brains are incredible, but this is a perfect example of our subconscious having Mm -hmm. thoughts that we don't even know we have had. And when people say, I'm not racist, I'm not prejudiced, you may not believe you are. I believe Mm -hmm. I'm not. However, I do know that there are biases and those biases come from a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge and a lack of exposure growing up. Even though I don't judge someone by the color of their skin, I do have an, and not intentional biases 
unintentional subconscious biases. And I think that's really important to note that, and a black person could have those about white people. Mm -hmm. it, it goes both ways. And I think that we have to be conscious of what our brain is doing. We have to train our brain to think differently. So if you catch yourself having these thoughts, having these biases, double check them. Like, okay, is this a bias or is this real? Or could this be interpreted as prejudice? Or but double check, have that checks and balance system within yourself. And this could be for anybody just walking down the street at the grocery store on the playground with your children or as entrepreneurs or business people working with other people. You can't assume that everything is, and you have to double check the biases that you might be making those assumptions because. Of. And I think just to like hop on something that you said, because I feel like it can cause some confusion with people who are listening. When we're thinking about, or when we mentioned like any group of people can have prejudices and biases. That's just, again, that's just the function of our brain. For some people, it's from society. From, for some people, it's a safety measure, whatever it is, but we all have them. And the thing to understand is where do the power dynamics come into play? So when it comes to a white person having a prejudice, it's more, I want to say dangerous only because in this current day and age, in this country, white people are the ones who have the most power in terms yes. of if something happens, oh, the white person will be listened to first and they have the say in what's going on. And therefore that's how things can become like systemic. So even in the example that I gave, it's not just one appraiser person list thinking that it's multiple appraiser people who are in a position of power and are now affecting black wealth because of these prejudices versus a smaller group of people having a prejudice about someone or a bias about someone, but nothing can happen as a result of that. There's no changes in the world that happen as a result of a minority group having a prejudice or a bias. Does that Makes sense. Oh, it does. It does. And I certainly was not. I'm glad you clarified that because I wasn't mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. I'm glad you clarified that because there is, yes, there is a difference. And I think that just the natural status of mm -hmm. the majority comes into play there. And exactly. just, just history that white mm -hmm. people have always had more power, more influence. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking before and when I mentioned to the listeners and everything about how I found you and there was something that my coach put in that Instagram post and it was seeing everyone as capable and powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's what anti-racism work is about. And you very quickly said, wait, I didn't say that her coach said that, but then you added to that. But I yes. love that phrase. Anti-racism work is about seeing everyone as capable and powerful. And that's, it's something that's near and dear to my heart because at face to face, when we work with our guests that come in, like we see them as human beings that have mm -hmm. the potential to transform. They may be marginalized now. They may be stuck in a cycle of poverty. They may have grown up poor and they may still be poor. They may be in this cycle long-term, but there, to me, there's always hope that cycle can be broke if they have the right resources to help them transform. I just believe that humans can transform and transition. So to me, seeing everyone as capable and powerful is such a powerful statement. I don't know what yeah. other words to use, but I would love to hear your perspective on that and how maybe you can give us some insight on how we can change our thoughts and change how we intercept bias when it comes into play and transfer those thoughts to something more meaningful like this statement. Yes. And I think what's important to really think about is that something that I've heard a lot over the last couple of years is, oh yeah, obviously we all have like prejudices and biases, but it doesn't affect the work that I do. It doesn't come into my work. And I first and foremost want us all to be heavily realistic about that, right? Like the appraiser that I gave the example of, 
I'm pretty sure that person does not see how their biases or prejudices are affecting people's lives. They are just looking at this house from a neutral state. They don't hate anybody. <laughs> they don't have these active thoughts, but it's coming into the way that they are supporting people because of the assumptions that come with the prejudices and biases. So that's just the first thing that I want us all to continue to challenge ourselves with so that we do actively continue this work if we want to support people that don't just look like us. But in regards to seeing people as like capable and powerful, for me, I think it's when we tend to think about anti-racism in general, it's from a, let me help those people over there. Oh, those poor people. Oh my gosh, let me help them. And it's not that we're saying we need your help. We need this entire system to be undone. And coming from a place of like sympathy of, oh my gosh, poor person, let me try to do all of these extra things instead of what we're actually saying is, please be mindful of your prejudices and biases and how they affect my livelihood. Also, please really understand the power that you have and do something to change the system instead of focusing your attention on feeling bad for me. And that is what that looks like in, in general. But I feel like even as a business owner, that looks like, what am I doing right now that is playing into this exact same system that I'm then turning around and saying, poor baby to the other person, what can I do to undo that system so that they can use their full capability and powerfulness instead of having to overexert themselves in order to just be at the same level as where you are. I love that. And there's a level of mutual respect there in order mm -hmm. to get to that point. So instead of poor pitiful you, I'm going to throw money at you to make you feel better. No, that's not the answer. The answer is going deeper than that and teaching, educating, supporting, holding hand, mm -hmm. doing things together versus just putting a bandaid on a situation. Like one example that I'm thinking of again, because of HGTV, but one example that I'm thinking about right now is like the curb cuts on sidewalks for it, for people with wheelchairs to be able to go through. I'm just thinking of life pre curb cuts, how people must've been looking at people with wheelchairs. Oh, this poor person, they can't even go to the store. They can't even do anything. I'm just going to just do that. And if I can't do that, cause that's a lot of energy to now dedicate yourself to a whole entire human, which thinking about this situation with anti-racism, a lot of people did that. They threw themselves into what they be believed was the work and they got exhausted. And then they pulled out because it's exhausting compared to, I see there's a problem over there. Let me actually address that. And then boom, curb cuts became a thing. And now that person can take themselves to the store compared to you feeling like they're hopeless and helpless and trying to deal with it in that way. Yeah. And that message of hope, I think is so incredibly important. Yeah. And I think at the same time too, I'm a single mom. So something that like the common rhetoric around single moms is like the superwoman, the this, the that, like all of these things. And it's for me, I don't want to be anyone's superwoman. I don't want to like have to deal with 12 other things that everyone else doesn't have to deal with for me to be put on a pedestal. I just want to live my life in the exact same way that everyone else is and understanding what needs to be undone for that. For some people that may be finances, for some people that may be systemic changes, for some people it may be something else, but really trying to not sit into this mindset of just, oh, but they're so capable, they're powerful that they're able to overcome all these things. I don't want to overcome anything. <laughs> I just want to exist and really trying to hold both of those two in a balance where you're owning your responsibility, but you're also not trying to save people. Yeah. This has been a fabulous conversation, very eye opening, and especially the part about the biases, because it's something that I have thought about this. And like just in our home, our family, like we've had these conversations. Is mm. that bias? Is that not bias? Is that prejudiced? Is it not prejudiced? Because you don't know. And when you, your primary community is the same as you are very mm. hard to know. And that's really why I just encourage people to go deeper when doing this work, especially like 
I am always very excited whenever I see anyone start a business or just have a business because I'm just like, you are all these other jobs, these corporate places, they started off as somebody's business and then it grew. And when we look at ourselves like that, as like someone, we may not want 70,000 employees. We are someone who can create a thing that has impact that when we say something on the internet, people take it as fact. People take it as something that they're influenced by when we have to hire someone right now, we are creating a life for them that they didn't have without our business. Mm -hmm. And so just taking into account the level of responsibility that we have as business owners, as moms too, understanding how that all comes into play in deciding to do this work deeper than a lot of us have been thinking about what this, what doing the work means over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion around it. And I think you're right. There was a lot of ex- exhaustion after 2020. Like everybody was gung-ho because they were home. They were working from home. Things were just more simple. And then all of a sudden real life started to come back and other things came into play. A priority mm. shifted. The energy level shifted. Everything changed. And so things got forgotten. They got pushed aside. But what I really don't want to see happen anymore is that it takes these tragedies. It takes trauma. It takes something so big for people to wake up. It's like enough Mm -hmm. of this already. Let's try to do things on a daily basis versus waiting until everything collapses and we have to rebuild completely. And that's my fear is that I don't want this to put animosity between our races because there's been enough of that. So conversations like this hopefully will help break down those barriers versus building them up. And I think there was a time period in 2020 when things got built up before they started to chip away again. So I'm hoping that we can be more open-minded, more receptive, more curious, less assumptive and, and come hand in hand and work together. So anyway, I'm honored that you took the time out of your busy schedule to be here and share with us. Do you have any last words of wisdom you would like to share? I think the biggest thing for me is just in watching how everyone's been interacting with this work over the last couple of years is I feel like the mindset has been, this is a thing that I have to do for this group of people. And in reality, that's a very like white centered way of thinking of it. I'm thinking of this work as this is what I'm doing for my clients, because I'm going to have clients from every background work that I'm doing for my future employees is the work that I'm doing for my children, because they're going to be interacting with people with all different backgrounds compared to this is almost a piece of charity work that I'm doing for someone else. This is the same thing as everything goes into this. It's marketing, it's program creation. It's literally everything as we would do for the white audience. It's for everyone. So when we look at it that way, we can shift our responsibility in doing it instead of this is another thing that I have to add on the side. This is something that should just be a part of that way that we're all doing business. I agree. And it's not, I think the black population has been at the forefront but you, we also have the Asian population. We have the mm-hmm. Indian population. We have the Jewish population. Like it's mm-hmm. not just one population that this work needs to be done for. This is something that is truly a broad scope. It's not just one. And right. I, so I like how you said that. This is something that we need to do and incorporate into our lives in all aspects of our lives, not just in the workplace, not just at home, but everywhere across all nationalities, across all races and ethnic backgrounds. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This was fabulous. Alyssa, how can the listeners connect with you, learn more from you? Yeah, they can find me on my website, uh, alyssahallcoaching.com. So on Instagram at AR Leadership, that stands for anti-racist leadership. And on LinkedIn, just type in Alyssa Hall. There's a lot of Alyssa Halls. Like my name is quite common. So it'll take some digging, but you'll find me. (laughs) I will put the links to all of that in the show notes. So listeners, you can 
find her. And I will say she has a free ebook on her website about anti-racism. And so if you are curious and want to dive deeper, I highly recommend you go to her website and download that workbook. And I think you can just go to the website and find it. I saw it when I was on your website earlier, but I'll put the yeah. links to all of those things in the show notes. And I highly encourage everybody to go check her out. So thank you, Alyssa, for being here. And listeners, if you wouldn't mind, I would be so grateful if you would take some time to share this episode and write a rating and review. This is a very important message. It's something that's near and dear to my heart, and I am trying very hard to open my heart and open my mind to understand it better. But I think I'm just one person, and we all need to do this together. So if you wouldn't mind sharing this episode, I would be so grateful, and I know Alyssa would be too. And if you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, That is how more eyes get on the show, how more people find us and how I can continue to have great guests like Alyssa and all of the others that we have on the show. So thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day and I will see you next week.